Welcome to World Affairs Today, brought to you by the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C., a leading forum for global education and international affairs. Good afternoon, and welcome to the World Affairs Council's Distinguished Speaker Program. I'm Heidi Shoup, President of the Council, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all here today. This program is being filmed for the broadcast on the Council's weekly international affairs television program, World Affairs Today, that airs nationally on Sunday mornings on MHC Worldview Television. Please remember to turn off your mobile phones at this time as a courtesy to our speakers and to our audiences at home. We are here at the Jack Morton Auditorium on the campus of George Washington University in Washington, D.C. I would be remiss if I did not thank the George Washington University administration and particularly Dr. Stephen Knapp for the use of these wonderful facilities. We are privileged today to host the Honorable Chuck Hagel, now Chairman of the Atlantic Council, and His Excellency Juan Valle de Almeida, the Ambassador of the Delegation of the European Union to the United States, for what no doubt will be a timely and thought-provoking discussion of the Euro crisis and its implications for the transatlantic partnership. To moderate the discussion, we are pleased to have Stella Dawson with us. Ms. Dawson is the U.S. Specialist Economics Director at Thomson Reuters. She has had a distinguished career as an economics and politics journalist. She worked with Reuters as chief correspondent in Frankfurt and later as global editor for economics and financial markets. At Thomson Reuters, she previously served as the news editor. She will be introducing our speakers today, so without further comment, please join me in welcoming Ms. Dawson and our distinguished speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heidi. You could scarcely have chosen a more appropriate day and a more appropriate topic. And we have very eminent speakers with us to join us in this very interesting discussion. Let me make a few remarks just to set the scene, just in case somebody's not been reading the news recently. Uh, Europe's future hangs in the balance. As a journalist, I don't like to make hyperbolic statements, but I don't think that that's over-exaggerating right now. One path points toward a closer fiscal and political union and a financial union. The other, the path we've been on, muddle through, which has led to only turmoil, trouble, and financial market challenges. At worst, this could lead to Eurozone breakup. 13 years after launching the monetary union, the very survival of this bold experiment is now in question. What I find so intriguing about the European Union is that it's decided to use economics as the cement to bind the countries together. Now, this is unusual in that one usually comes together in a political union and then decides to follow up with your currency and your market union. But this time around, it's been the economics that the European leaders have decided is the tool that they're going to use after a half a century of horrendous wars to cement this, country, this uh, region together. It's quite the opposite of what's expected, but we have 17 European countries that have decided to give up their own currencies. They've decided to sacrifice the ability to have their own currency, to have their own interest rate, and to put severe restrictions on their fiscal policy in order to join in monetary union. But today, that experiment is being very sorely tested. The financial crisis has unhinged their economies. Just look at the numbers. Greece alone, its GDP has shrunk by 15% since 2008. Greece and Spain are looking at over 22% unemployment and rising. Uh, youth unemployment is about 50%. Four countries, Ireland, Portugal, Greece, and now Spain this weekend have had to go for bailout money. And why? It's because those countries have debt to GDP that is too high. The markets say it's unsustainable. They have banking systems that are deeply troubled. So what's the route out? Washington has got one solution. Washington is pushing for a true European-wide banking system and a clear roadmap toward a fiscal and political union. Can Europe achieve this? Is this realistic? 
Does it have the political will to take that additional step forward, go beyond economic union, give up more national sovereignty, and build a euro that's fit to last? Or is the political union a dream that's fading, that's going away with that post-war generation of leaders that thought that this was the way to end wars? For the United States, can we afford to allow our closest ally to sink? Can we risk an economic disaster and failed states on the southern rim of Europe? And what are the lessons for our own fiscal problems back here at home? Now, to address this, I can think of few people who are more qualified to consider these issues. To discuss them, we have with us Ambassador Valdelameda. He is from a true European. He's born in Lisbon. He studied history there. And he joined the European Commission, which, for those who are not familiar, is essentially the executive arm of the European Union in 1982. And he's worked with its greats, most notably Jacques Delors, who's commonly known as the father of monetary union and the single market. Between 2004 and 2009, Ambassador Valdelameda was the chief of staff for the European Commission, working for President José Manuel Barroso. So he's been at the heart of those EU summits that we hear endlessly about, and is about to come up with yet another one. Uh, he also worked on the Lisbon Treaty that uh, has reformed some of the governments of Europe. He came to Washington in August 2010 as head of the European Union's delegation to the United States, representing Commission President Barroso, and also the European Council of Leaders President, Herman von Rompuy. Uh, von Rompuy. So who else could have such extensive inside knowledge? We welcome your ambassador. But to begin our discussion, we have Senator Chuck Hagel. Senator Hagel, of many as you know, is chairman of the Atlantic Council and a distinguished press professor at Georgetown University, a fourth, town, a fourth generation Nebraskan. He served in the US Senate from 1996 until 2009. He sat on the Foreign Relations Committee, the Intelligence Committee, and the Banking Committee, and has held subcommittee chairmanships, uh, most no notably for this occasion, international economic policy and banking, two big issues that are facing Europe right now. Senator Hagel is a Vietnam veteran, where he served with his brother in 1968 in the US Army's 9th Infantry Division, earning many decorations, including two Purple Hearts. He joined my profession briefly as a radio talk show host, and then headed to Washington as a congressional aide. In the private sector, he co-founded a mobile phone company, Vanguard Cellular, and an investment firm before he ran for the US Senate. But on Capitol Hill, he's earned a reputation as principled and intellectually rigorous, perhaps one of a dying breed, a gentleman that reached across the aisle to reach compromises. <laughs> a Republican, he even scored higher marks at times amongst Democrats in opinion polls for his positions. And he was unafraid to criticize incompetent policies, most notably his criticism of the Iraq war. This is a man who will pull no punches. I'm sure he will be equally critical where necessary of the United States' approach toward Europe and of Europe's approach to his own problems Please join me in welcoming Senator Hagel. Thank you. Ambassador, thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dawson, thank you. Ms. Dawson, thank you very much for your uh, thoughtful uh, introduction. Well, let me um, begin my, uh, my thoughts on the issue that we will explore in uh, some detail this afternoon with a more general scope of at least where uh, I think uh, we, we uh, advisedly we, uh, because I include all seven billion people on the face of the earth, because we uh, are all truly now global citizens. Uh, that um, global society is underpinned by a global economy. We are not going to unravel that. Uh, we are going to continue to face the issues that we uh, are having to grapple with when a new world order is being built, and that's what's occurring in the world today. A new world order is being built. Uh, new structures uh, are being built. Old structures are accommodating and adjusting to the realities of the kinds of challenges that uh, the early 21st century uh, is testing us all with. One of those uh, dimensions, it seems to me, and I think it's playing out in Europe today, uh, in particularly when you look at the Eurozone, 
and what those 17 nations uh, are dealing with. And you further examine the 17 nations of the Eurozone in the broader sense of the 27 nations of the European Union. Uh, and that sometimes uh, is not uh, noted, but I think it's an important part of this because uh, if you have uh, a union, the EU of 27 nations, but yet two, but yet 10 of those nations are not part of the of the currency. Uh, essentially, meaning that 17 nations, through their individual sovereign monetary policy, into one basket, and uh, is now part of that singular monetary system. Uh, but yet there are other parts left out. That's, that's not an easy uh, dimension and dynamic to have to work your way through, and that's some of what's going on. And I think in a larger sense, uh, if you extend beyond the borders of the European Union and specifically the borders of the 17 nations of the Euro, uh, what I think is a big part of this is the centrifugal force of a global economy pulling nations down into one global economic unit clashing with the sovereign nation prerogatives of individual states, nation states, those are realities. And I think if you, which we'll get into, look at, for example, the some of the nations of the EU, uh, Greece, which we'll talk a little bit about, I'm sure, today, um, Spain, Portugal, Italy, uh, some of the nations who are having the most difficulty, uh, where their people uh, are, are saying to other nations in the Euro, Germany uh, probably being the the best example with the strongest and biggest economy, uh, we're not going to allow you to tell us what to do on an austerity program uh, or any other part of a demand that you are making to help work us through this problem. Uh, the Germans, the French, other uh, economies who are in better shape, bigger, stronger, uh, are responding, uh, understandably so, their people, with well, if you people who live in these other countries want to continue your profligate way of life, that's your business, but uh, we are not going to bail you out. Now, I know I'm simplifying this, but that's essentially a clash that's part of the reality here. But, but you can take that far beyond the borders of Europe, what's going on all over the world. And, and you are seeing uh, very clearly uh, this uh, nation-state sovereignty being played out uh, or a nation-state sovereignty that's not quite there. The Middle East is probably the best example of that. Uh, wh what are the rights of the individual in Egypt? And we're going to have an election, uh, as you know, this weekend. Uh, obviously, there's another fairly significant election that's already been noted in Greece uh, this weekend. The French are, are having round two of the parliamentary elections. Uh, we're going to see a new president elected in Mexico. We're going to have a presidential election in the United States in November. I know you've not noticed, but there is a campaign uh, ongoing, been going on for some time. The Chinese are going to change their leadership. The Russians have just gone through a presidential election. So, so when you step back, and I think you must before you really start to focus on any dimension of what's going on in Europe uh, or with the Eurozone, uh, these are but just some of these nation-state sovereign developments that are occurring. Uh, and the other side of that, which I talked about in more specific terms as centrifugal force of a global economy pulling people together, these institutions like the UN, the IMF, World Bank, uh, these global institutions that were set up after World War II to in, in fact build a new world order and in fact, in my opinion, we needed them, and I think we may need them more today uh, than ever before. They're imperfect. 
All institutions are. They can't solve every problem. Uh, but we are going through a very difficult period in the world of adjusting to these new realities and challenges so that these institutions are commensurate uh, with dealing with those new challenges and those uh, new realities. It is a very difficult uh, adjustment to make for all nation states as well as a global uh, dimension of global citizenry that is so interconnected. Technology and globalization have driven everything. What happened is happening, will continue to happen in the Middle East, North Africa over the last 15 to 17 months. Uh, could not have happened, I, I suspect, uh, without the kind of technology uh, that drove communications, that drove the kind of communication organization and all that goes into that, that um, we now have uh, at our fingertips, every, every nation. That brings expectation. Uh, that brings new education. That brings information. That's all very powerful. And, and when you do something with that, uh, th then you can harness new powers that the world's uh, never quite seen before. And all of this is, is really produced something the world in, in a global dimension has never seen before, and that is that the circuits are so overloaded on every institution in the world, we're blowing out circuits everywhere. No institution is strong enough, big enough, nor is any country uh, to deal with what's going on in the world today. And all of these forces are coming at us at the same time. And this kind of volatility uh, always produces confusion. It produces, in some cases, chaos. It produces, in some cases, conflict. Uh, all the more reason for steady, wise, careful, integrated, global partnerships and, and relationships. Uh, I, uh, for many, many years, have believed and gave speeches about it, talked about it in the Senate uh, as a businessman, different things that uh, I'm involved in today, uh, about something you're all familiar with, uh, public-private partnerships. Well, these public-private partnerships have not now gone beyond just the more defined public-private partnership of a corporation, government, or private sector, public sector uh, relationships. Uh, we now include certainly NGOs, and, and non-governmental organizations may be more important, and I suspect will be more important, and will play more of a significant role in the outcomes of many of these regions in the world than ever before, if for no other reason, because they are institutions that are far more trusted by the people than a government or a corporation uh, for the obvious reasons. Now, there is no such thing that I've found that's, that's perfect, that's absolutely without fault, that makes every decision the right way. But that's the other element and we see it, I think, in the United States that we have to be careful with. How many talk shows, uh, how many uh, exchanges on any cable television network or radio talk show um, have you heard, have you watched, are you aware of that has any semblance of actually trying to find some common, on, a common denominator of agreement, uh, of actually trying to find a solution uh, I have not found one yet, and, but raise your hand if you've got one. Uh, no, it's all about divide. It's all about opposition. It's all about confrontation. No, that's free speech. That's okay. And it's up to the citizen. We can turn it off or turn it on. But we are pounded consistently with what's wrong, what doesn't work, and confrontation, confrontation, confrontation. And I just give you one example. Uh, I used to appear uh, often on Sunday morning talk shows. And more than occasionally, I would uh, hear or see uh, or, or be aware of some reference that I was going to be on a talk show Sunday morning. And the setup was that Senator Hagel was going to clash with and take on Senator X. Well, that was news to me that I was going to clash with Senator X and take on and we were going to have a shootout over entitlements or whatever. Uh, I, I agreed to go on a show uh, to exchange ideas. If someone else has a different opinion, that's all part of it. Should be, of course. 
but to build this into kind of the gunfight at the OK Corral kind of drama and show business is, is unfortunately uh, what we have. And that helps drive all this, too. And so what that does is you, you've got now the reality. And it isn't just the media. It, it's, it's the whole social dimension of, of what we're all trying to work our way through. Um, it, is you've got no confidence now in the United States of America and any institution except the military. Gallup does its annual survey of institutions. I think they've been doing it for 18 years now, and they take the 15 most significant institutions, education, healthcare, uh, government, politics, Wall Street, religion, uh, labor, corporations, and w what they found this spring in their latest uh, edition was every institution uh, in America that was part of that index of 15 were recording record low numbers of confidence and trust by the American people. Religion and education as well. And it was the military, and only the military, that still had a fairly significant high rating. And you can imagine where politicians were, and government was, and especially New York, Wall Street, bankers. Um, and so what you have then in a situation where we are today, and by the way, this is amplified across the globe, uh, is a nation, nations, a world, that has lost confidence in their leaders, in their institutions, and everything. And everyone in this audience knows that uh, markets, and the world is a marketplace. It isn't just Wall Street. The, the market, when people talk about the market, it, it isn't just NASDAQ or Dow Jones. The world is a marketplace for ideas, for commodities, for wh whatever it is. Education is a marketplace. Religion is a marketplace. You're looking for customers all the time. Now, you may reframe that. You don't call them customers in, in some cases, but that's what you're looking for, converts, customers, whatever it is, students, customer, whatever it is. But, but when you've got no base of confidence or trust in that marketplace, then you've got a problem. You've got a big problem. Because the only way we get out of this and again, using the Congress of the United States and in our political system, and in our political system it may be imperfect, but it's the only system that brings you to any kind of consensus in order to move the issues onto some higher ground than to hopefully find some solutions that will hopefully lead to a resolution and make decisions. But if you don't have the consensus, if you don't have the compromise, uh, th then you will continue continue to flounder and do great damage uh, to your country. Now, we've got uh, the realities in this country of what's coming down toward the end of the year. There's no one in this audience that doesn't understand some of the big issues that are at stake. Now, those are going to happen. The clock is ticking. Those aren't disconnected from what's going to be the outcome in, uh, in Europe on the euro. Uh, and the ambassador, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about this uh, here in just a, a couple of minutes, but all of this is, is, is interconnected. You can't separate any of these, these pieces. That's, again, part of the complications of the world in, in which we're living. So this volatility that's been built into the system now, that's part of the, the global reality, as I suspect we'll be living with uh, for a while, because if, if, if for no other reason, there, there's, no, there's no easy, quick answer to this. We, partly, we've got to find a, a new sense of gravity, a center of gravity. We've got to find ourselves uh, in a position where we have a renewed sense of balance, because I think America has been off balance since 9-11, uh, 2001. And I hear it uh, everywhere I go. I, I see it everywhere I go. I hear it in my students. I speak all over the country, stay connected to people, listen carefully, always did. Uh, and there, there's a question that keeps coming up. What's happened to America? What's happened to the world? Is no one in charge? Uh, are we incapable of governing ourselves? Is Europe incapable? Uh, is the so-called China model now the best model? I had somebody say the other day, but Senator, 
you know, at least the Chinese can make decisions. I mean, they can get decisions made. And I said, well, that's true. Now, I'm not sure you want to trade your system, which is a democratic system, a free system. It's, it's uh, many times inadequate, I get it. Uh, not efficient, I get it. But uh, in systems of, of authoritarian government, essentially dictatorship, uh, you can make decisions. Uh, they, and they can come pretty fast. But I'm not sure you want to give that up, what you've got, in order for the quick decisions. But that's the kind of, of thinking that's going on out there, or at least the probing and the questioning. And so our institutions and our leaders today, at every level and in every institution, uh, have got to be better than we've ever been. And, and, I, and I really believe that. Now, uh, I'll, I'll wind this up this way. What we're dealing with is a course correction. The, these are, are fairly uh, historic, and they, are, they come usually uh, over the last few centuries we've had, uh, a couple of times every 100 years, a course correction. We have course corrections in our politics. We have course corrections in corporations, course corrections in institutions. New presidents come in, take on new challenges, the deans. There isn't an institution that does not always undergo course corrections. Society undergoes, undergoes course corrections. People uh, go, go in those directions. If nothing else, you take personal inventory of yourself. You have to. And, and that's what's going on on a, on a global scale that we've never, ever seen before, because we've never been here before. Think of what's going on in the world. We've never, the world, None of us have ever seen anything like this. Now, that's just the reality of it. We're not going to unwind. There's no point in whining about it. There's no, there's no point in blaming everybody else for it. Is we've got to fix it. And, I, and I, will, I will end this way. Now, I haven't been around for all of that history, even for a weak-minded former senator I occasionally read. And it's pretty clear to me here that uh, all these new challenges that, that I, I do believe that we're dealing with um, are now also connected to, just like the great historian Arnold Denton, Toynbee used to talk about challenge response. It isn't challenges, it's the response. Every generation deals with challenges. Everybody deals with challenges. Yes, they get more complicated. And yes, they're different, each generation. But you, you deal with challenges. Everybody j deals with challenges. It's how you respond to those challenges. And so w when you look at the balance sheet of those challenges that we're dealing with today and the young people in this audience, what, what they're going to have to be dealing with over the next 40 years is the capacity uh, is historic as well. We in the world have more capacity to deal with these challenges than, than we've ever had. The world's never seen such capacity as the world possesses today. With all the challenges, all the problems, we've got actually more capacity to deal with them. Take energy. Uh, of all the newspapers I read over the weekend and read the editorial pages, all of them were good. Friedman's, all of them were good. They always are good. But there was one that really stood out because I thought the one that I'm going to tell you about as I take my seat here in a moment is one that may have more to do with the outcome of how all this works its way out, not just in America, but uh, in the world. Um, and that was Daniel Urigan's piece in the New York Times about America's new energy reality. You all know at least uh, some of this about the new discoveries of fossil fuels in the United States and the Western Hemisphere. At the same time, we're putting more research into renewable energy, solar, wind, so on, than we ever have. And we'll continue to do that, as we should. Uh, but what's happening here, in Jurgen's mind, and I happen to believe that he's right on this, uh, not because uh, Daniel Jurgen is one of the smartest, uh, most informed, most knowledgeable people about energy in the world, but you, you take it other analyses of what he's talking about, and they'll come to, they come to the same conclusion. If you develop energy resources at every level, 
as, as we are here in the Western Hemisphere in the United States. And, and you take the reliance of the United States and the Western Hemisphere uh, a, away from going to the Middle East or other parts of the world for energy. Do you think that changes balances of power? Do you think that changes alliances? Do you think that's going to shift anything? The pipelines going on in, uh, in Europe today, uh, in the Caspian, Turkey's doing, coming in. Do you think that's not going to shift alliances? Do you think that's not going to have an impact uh, on, on how Western Europe deals with Russia? Uh, immense, immense changes are coming over one issue, energy. Why is that? Well, no country grows. You can't grow without energy. Everyone needs energy. It is a common denominator, not quite as, as important as, as oxygen or water or food or probably medicine, but energy is right up at the top. Energy drives it all. It's the machine. So you start seeing these huge shifts in energy resources in the world, it is going to have amazing, immense changes, maybe bigger than almost uh, anything. All of these forces are now in play in the world today, and that's what we're dealing with. I'm uh, hopeful. I'm optimistic. I think we're up to the challenge. Uh, we don't have any choice. Uh, we, we can't walk away, can't run away, can't blame our way out of it. Can't say, well, it's the Chinese's fault or the Indians' fault. Chinese got huge problems. Indians have bigger problems. Um, so when you look at the two largest economies in the world, which the ambassador knows an awful lot about, the European Union and, and the United States, we've got a lot to work with. We've got a lot to be thankful for. Uh, we've got organized, structured societies and institutions that can work our way through it. Now it's a matter of the information and education and the will of the wise leader ship that's going to require that kind of steady march forward uh, to do it. Won't be easy. It'll be up and down. It'll be volatile, uh, but it'll happen. Well, thank you for an opportunity to share some of my thoughts and look forward to the ambassador's uh, comments. Thank you very much. Thank you. thank you very much, Senator Hagel. Very provocative remarks, extremely interesting. Uh, I think that's a very good way to turn to you, Ambassador Valdelameda. Uh, Senator Hagel has laid out a situation where the nation state is under challenge, uh, where there's questions over the capability of governance. Fundamental questions. Is Europe up to the challenge? Well, first of all, it's great to hear uh, Senator Hagel with such inspiring and wise and optimist remarks. I think we all need that in times of... Uh, sometimes uh, skepticism and even cynicism about our capacity over here and in Europe to deal with these challenges. So thank you, Senator, for all long-lasting commitment to this kind of values, to the transatlantic relationship. And it's great to, uh, to hear you in these um, kind of uh, events uh, for which I thank the World Affairs Council and uh, the university and you as well. It's a pleasure to be here and also with so many young people uh, certainly worried about what, uh, uh, what they will face in the real world in the next uh, decades. But I would like to share uh, the Senator's optimism. Uh, and, and I'm frank. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm paid to be optimist, but I, I'm actually optimist about, about what may happen to, to the world. But I'm realistic as well. And the first thing I would say, uh, very much following on what the Senator said, is that those who thought that history was over with the fall of the Berlin Wall, and some wrote very eloquent uh, comments and theses about that, they, they were totally wrong. Uh, there was, in fact, an acceleration of history after the fall of the, of the Berlin Wall. And I would say that, overall, uh, it, it has gone in the right direction. If you look at the effects of globalization, uh, this is good, you know, lifting millions, hundreds of millions of people out of poverty around the world is a good thing. Creating uh, uh, emerging middle classes in uh, China or India or Brazil is a good thing. Uh, these are forces that will certainly push forward uh, democracy, protection of human rights, 
individual freedom. This is our project. These are our values. So I think we should be positive and optimistic about the recent evolution of the world. I think it goes overall in the right direction. We have less wars today than we have in the past. We have more democracy today than we had in the past. If you take of Europe, all these countries that came out of the Iron Curtain to join Europe, if you, take of, if you think of the collapse of Soviet Union, if you think of the emerging values in the Chinese society, I think we all, this all goes in the right direction. Yeah. But We've been through a financial crisis, but, which has changed of course, what has happened in the last 20 years. Of with the acceleration of history come you know, more contradictions, more challenges, and more confrontations, and more tension in our system. And I think the senator described uh, in a very appropriate way what our democracies face as challenges today. And sometimes people in Europe say, Europeans don't believe in Europe. And I look at the polls and I say they believe more in Europe they, than they believe in national parties, in national governments, in religious leaders, or trade union leaders which reflects what the Senate was saying, we are questioning the way we organize ourselves. We are challenging our established systems and asking them to provide different answers. And I think this is what we have to deal with today. But it's not uh, exclusive to Europe. I see the debate in the US as much as I see the tensions in China or India or Japan about you know, these very complex issues of economic, financial, monetary, social nature that countries, public opinions have to discuss. And my last point is to say that, of course, nation is no longer the right uh, dimension to deal with these issues. I used to say in Europe that all countries are small or too small to face all these challenges alone. The difference being that some have not yet realized it. And I would tend to say that this applies to the whole world. Who can today say, this is my little problem, I will solve it myself and I forget about the rest? The financial crisis you're referring to, which is of course a major factor in recent years, which will affect us for some years more, it started uh, with the subprime mortgage market in California. It spread to the entire United States, crossed the Atlantic, moved to China and Asia, and it became a, a world financial crisis. Problems in a country like Greece, which represents 2% of the EU's GDP, is a major issue for the international economy. So no nation alone can sort out its problems, not even China, as we are seeing in recent months. Uh, you know, sometimes people are a little bit obsessed with China. I finish here mm. because China is always the elephant in the room. Uh, too obsessed with China, thinking that China doesn't change. It's something that is there, a threat, an opportunity with no, no exact, but China is changing even faster than we are. And confronting every day new difficulties, new problems. And in dealing with the problems and the difficulties, it's changing itself. It's, it's a dynamic process. So I don't know where the world will be when my sons who are in the mid-20s will hopefully have some responsibility. Uh, I don't know. But I'm optimistic in the sense that the senator said. I think we have more capacity today. Uh, and this capacity is more aligned with our values than in the past uh, to deal with this. And this is what Europe is doing, but I'm sure I will have a couple of questions about the situation. I'd, li I'd like to press you a little about some of the pressing issues that we're facing right now. I agree with you, having worked in Europe, that there is a fundamental misunderstanding in this country that monetary union is a political project. And there's a political will and political determination, a commitment to the project. As you described, Europeans are very committed to Europe. But I'm growing increasingly pessimistic, because two years into this crisis, Half a trillion now has been spent on bailout of countries. Spain probably, although it's bailing out its banks now, may well end up in a full bailout program. The outcome of the Greek elections looks as if it well may elect a group that will be anti-bailout, wants to renegotiate the terms. Financial markets are running out of patience. George Soros said the other day that there's three months left. 
can Europe <clears throat> lay out a plan for where it's going in the next couple of months? If you look at uh, Europe's history, uh, 55, 60 years old, you will realize that we are not in the business of drawing a blueprint and respecting it or implementing it every day and adding and ticking a, a box every day. It's not the way we operate. Operate um, in crisis, though, Europe has succeeded. This yeah. is a crisis. That, that, that's, the, that's my point. We, don't, we didn't start with the blueprint. We said, well, in 1940, we do this, 1950, this, uh, 1960, whatever. No, it, it is an incremental process in the sense that it, it builds and it creates its own strength out of each step that we take. Uh, and for each step to be fully accomplished, you need to have the political conditions met. And the more you grow, and we started with six countries, we are now half a billion people, 27 countries, the more complex it becomes to, to create the conditions for, for progress. But when you do that, when you decide that we should go that way, then you have a, a leap forward. And uh, I used to say that we are addicted to crisis because that's the way we kind of grow. Like a, a teenager, you need to have you know, you, have, you need to have a fight with your father uh, because without that, you're not going to make yourself uh, grow. Are, are uh, we there right now? No, we are, we are permanently there in the sense <laughs> that, uh, you know, we have every day with 27 ministers or 27 prime ministers, we have to discuss, uh, create alliances, uh, create tension. Uh, you know, we never announce anything at 10.30 in the Rose Garden. <laughs> <laughs> we cannot <laughs> afford to announce it the day before. Tomorrow we're going to do this at 10.30 in the Rose Garden. Your system allows you to do that. And uh, uh, ours doesn't. Oh, we, have, we have the EU summit coming up June 28th. Yeah, have 29th. you ever seen that a, be our Rose Garden anything moment? announced at 10 o'clock in the morning in the EU no, summit? No, it's always no. 10 o'clock at it's night. It's 3, 4, 5 in the, <laughs> in the morning. Because it is the way we operate. Yeah. And if you think that, and I'm not commenting on the situation in this particular country. But if you imagine a country that only has one president, two parties, and one Congress, imagine that. And you realize how difficult it is for a country like that, which I'm not identifying, <laughs> to reach a consensus, multiply this by 27, and you will realize how difficult my life is. Two years in, so, <laughs> so two years into their fight, Senator Hagel, how important from the US perspective is it that some resolution of the path forward in Europe is shown within the next few weeks? Well, first, we should get the ambassador a drink soon after this is over. <laughs> um, and keep it well, until 3 in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think uh, it's always dangerous in and uh, a little uh, off the mark to prescribe dates in three months or two months or we've got to have it done now or, or, or whenever the timeline is. Um, the reality is no one really knows. Uh, you, you, you get a sense based on timelines. For example, we here in the United States, and often we do the preaching to the Europeans and others, around the world. That just didn't start. Um, well, why don't you take our TARP model? And I, I was in the Senate, senior member of the Banking Committee when all that happened. I, I think it was the right thing to do for the right reasons at the right time. But the reality is we didn't know anything. We, we didn't know what was going on. And we were charged with trying to assure as much as we could that we were doing the right thing in order to avoid a complete global financial collapse. Now, uh, we, we, I think, did that. Um, we're still working our way out of that because there were, there were huge issues. As the ambassador said, it was next to the, the Great uh, Depression of 1929. Uh, this has been the most significant uh, global financial crisis we've seen. And, and it's going to be with us for a while. I mean, th these are all residues of, of a lot of this, what we're dealing with today. But, but I think it is fair to say we avoided a complete financial crisis collapse. Now, uh, yes, I think the sooner the better. But I go back to something that the ambassador said, and I don't think we should use it as an excuse, and I don't think the Europeans are. 
Um, well, we have a different kind of system, and so the 1030 Rose Garden announcement is a, is, is, is a good analogy because their systems don't work that way. I don't think that there is, I don't know this, the ambassador does, I don't think there would be a finance minister uh, in the 27 countries in, of the Euro, European Union or any leaders who don't understand the severity of this or the immediacy of trying to resolve it. So I don't think that's an issue. But they, they have to figure this out on their own, working through all the dimensions that, that, that they have. Obviously, the sooner the better. But our TARP system, what we put in place, worked generally well for us. Imperfect, made mistakes, yes. Uh, doesn't mean that that would be the right answer for what they're going through. So I think we've got to just kind of work our way through this. I know I've read all the editorials. There were a bunch of them in the, in the papers this weekend about the imminent crisis, and it may happen that way. I mean, I, I don't know. But we, we've, got to, we've got to be more thoughtful here, it seems to me, on how we work with our European friends uh, on, on trying to find a resolution that, that allows enough cement to glue back here some confidence because you, you can't just keep papering over and you're some of the points that you're, you're making the Spanish issue on the loans to the banks is, is that enough is that 125 billion and will that just kind of defer the, the catastrophe for 60 days I don't know but but you've got to find this the right cement that starts building this back and, and it, it is not a quick deal uh, Reuters itself is reporting today that Europe's preparing for uh, a crisis that um, some of the capitals are uh, prepared to put limits on ATM withdrawals, put capital controls in, uh, suspend the passport-free travel in Europe if there's a breakup. I want to ask you, since it keeps coming up, what do you think are the risks that uh, Greece or one other country will re leave, leave the Eurozone? Ambassador. I think I, I, I learned from good politicians like Senator Hegel that the last thing you do is to comment on plan B. <laughs> Well, <laughs> while you're implementing Plan A. Uh, I'm glad there's a Plan B, though. As, as we are fully implementing and busy implementing Plan A, plan a no, no comments on Plan B. But, uh, of course, um, the issue is there. Uh, I think uh, my, my starting point will be to say what, what's, what's the cost-benefit analysis of, of such uh, an eventuality of a country leaving the Euro. From an economic point of view, from the political point of view, from a strategic point of view, not referring to any country in particular. But if, if the euro and the union was built on the assumption that the senator highlighted right now, which is that alone, I, nation, single nation, single country, cannot cope with all these challenges. If together we can better survive, I think this, in reverse, the same question should be asked now. So before I step out, I better think twice uh, about the consequences of stepping out and what you know, awaits me outside, uh, first question. Second question, for those who would remain in the zone, Eurozone, uh, they would also have to think about the cost of one living. Because when you have such a... a an intricate interdependence and interconnection, uh, it's obvious that the effects will not fall only on the country that leaves, but also on the countries that, that stay. So if you make these two simple cost-benefit analyses, you may come to some elements of solution. And if you add to that that, uh, you know, we live in a difficult world, and a more unpredictable world than the, the, the Cold War world, for, for for a number of reasons. Although I believe it's a much better world than the past, but in terms of security, in terms of, of uh, uh, you know, uh, being able to predict and prepare for the future is a more complicated world, a more complex world. Does a country, especially if it is relatively small, especially if it is relatively peripheral, uh, it's not as simple as that to say, I get out. What's next? Yeah. So I, I think yeah. without commenting on a plan B, uh, uh, I, th I think one should ask these fundamental questions before jumping too easily, as I see in some comments, to mm -hmm. say, why doesn't Greece leave and we stop there? Mm -hmm. No, it, it's never like that. So from the U.S.'s perspective, is there a security threat one has to consider of having failed states in the southern rim of Europe? 
Uh, well, of course, any uh, failed state is a concern. Um, failed states are always imperfect, as we've talked about. But failed states um, uh, have boundaries and parameters and structures that absorb shock. And if you don't have systems in a process that uh, allows for that absorption of shock, different things that will happen in societies. And these young people here are going to go through a, a lifetime of different shocks. We have. Uh, the world has. Uh, but hopefully they'll be on high enough ground to be able to deal with those, with those shocks. And we'll left, have left them a good enough structure and enough capacity to deal with them. All the, few, the previous generations in America have allowed that to happen here. My generation has been the beneficiary of, of the past generations who have built better structures, able to deal with those shocks as they come, whether it's been war, financial crisis, whatever. And they'll come. They'll come. And I think Europe could probably say the same in, in many uh, respects. So, um, sure, any failed state is not good news it, 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 because it, it presents a new risk of dimensions. It presents the risk of precedent. Uh, well, hell, we'll just break up. I mean, I mean if, you, if you want to take this to some extremes, I mean, it's, it's a different situation. But um, what's going on in the Middle East? What's going on in Syria today? Um, Libya is still, that's an uncertain how that's all going to come out. It's uncertain how Iraq's going to come out. Um, now, does, uh, does that mean that, uh, that we should go back to dictators and so on? Well, that's not what I'm advocating for, but that there's a great always unknown and uncertainty what comes next uh, and, and what are you going to have? What kind of a, a nation, what kind of a state are you going to have? So, no, I don't think you can necessarily equate Syria and the Middle East countries that are in conflict now with something happening to Greece or something. But, but there are parallels in this. And, it, it, and this is what leaders have to be very careful with. And I, and I know everyone's impatient, but you've got to think through these things carefully. And I think uh, uh, we haven't always done that uh, particularly well. Which returns again that this is the political momentum. Absolutely. Politics, Europe. you can't take the political yeah. drama and dynamic out of any of this. Yeah. We have one question from the audience. Yeah, my question is only for the ambassador. Um, in the economic debates around the Eurozone crisis, um, people have said that Europe has a lack of institutions to handle the crisis in terms of fiscally. Um, and so I, my question would be why um, they don't have those institutions or whether or not you agree with that because since the Treaty of Rome and Maastricht, there have been opportunities to address that and it hasn't happened, so. Well, there are opportunities and there is political will. And uh, in a democracy, political will is more important than the opportunity. And uh, uh, I think we've done a lot. I mean, uh, you know, I sometimes challenge my American friends and audiences by asking, where were you when we, you were 55? <laughs> uh, we've done all this in 55 years, which is exactly my age. That's why I, I know. Uh, in 55 years, we achieved quite a lot. Uh, and we cannot change Europe in 55 years, although we did a lot to, that could uh, amount to changing Europe fundamentally. But uh, uh, what I see today, and I'm trying to be short, what I see today in, Europe, uh, in European debate as we speak is, as I said earlier, everything goes in the direction of more Europe, not less. So we have today, because of the crisis, and you always need a sort of an external factor to uh, you know, speed up things in, in a system like ours. Uh, because of the financial crisis, because of the tensions inside the euro area, we are talking today about moving even further um, uh, towards a fiscal union, a banking union, a full political union, with uh, more sovereignty transferred from national uh, bodies to uh, European entities. So all this goes in the direction of creating the institutions that allow you to have a perfect uh, currency union, to have a banking union of solidarity among member states as far as the banking system is concerned, and eventually a higher stage of, of political unity. We already have some elements of it, not all of them. So uh, this is the trend. 
Uh, but uh, so we'll have to see, can, meet can again in 55 years to yes. see where we are. But <laughs> yes. uh, I'm Sir? sure, as I said, that we are accelerating the pace of change in Europe today. Sir? Yeah, I think you kind of just answered my question, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we were talking about um, an increased capacity, which is all very nice, but um, do you believe that the EU has enough autonomy to actually use this capacity uh, or must something change more? Uh, and of course, as you said, it's going in that direction, but you think something has to can fundamentally change. Can you do it quickly change. enough? <laughs> um, so well, we, we are problems. democracies. Again, don't, don't forget this point. Uh, this is not a technocratic process. This is a democratic process. And the last thing we want is to lose contact with, with the people, is to lose support from the people to the European project. That would be a worse solution, because you can have a solution for tomorrow, which will last a few months, and then uh, the voters will, uh, will knock it down. Because you need to be sufficiently close to the will of people, because these are complex entities. And people are, uh, as we said earlier, as the senator particularly, people are suspicious, they are nervous, they are afraid of what might come. So you need always to be very sure that the decisions you take have enough uh, support in the public opinion. You need to explain, you need to be pedagogical, uh, and you cannot be too far ahead of, the, of, the, of your public opinion because you may lose contact. And then if you lose contact, you open the way for, uh, for populism in the way we interpret populism in Europe to extreme right or extreme left uh, solutions, uh, demagogical one, and we have some elements of that in the European debate today. So I think our politicians are very, and if you think of some of them, particularly the Chancellor, Chancellor of Germany, very attentive to you know, making sure that the German public opinion understands and supports what she's doing. I think this element of uh, political will and democratic accountability is one that is opposed to simple technocratic solutions for the problem. I very much regret that we're going to have to wrap up. We do have a number of other people who would like to talk to you, so hopefully at the end. Uh, but just to quickly summarize, I think that the ambassador has convinced us that the answer is more Europe, not less that uh, crisis is the furnace in which a new for future is forged, and that crises have served very well. And since we seem to be heading toward yet another, I would hope that it will keep us on a good track. And Senator Hegel has very eloquently sketched out for us how we are in the midst of immense global change, how the very nature of the nation state is being redefined, and that we are challenged to redefine it. We have the capacity, do we have the will? We have the ability to carve a new future. Thank you. Uh, Senator? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Doctor. Thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you for joining us for World Affairs Today, a production of the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C. Stay connected with us at www.worldaffairstoday.org.